Hi, welcome to this module. Uh, we're going to discuss fraud, internal control, and cash. Some of the uh, more interesting topics in, in accounting, actually. Under fraud and internal control, we'll, we'll have a definition of fraud. We'll briefly, very briefly, kick around the Sarbanes-Oxley Oxley Act. Uh, we'll dwell on internal controls and principles of good internal controls, and then talk about the limitations. We'll look at cash controls, uh, both receiving cash and paying cash. We'll look briefly at uh, bank reconciliation and uh, features of using a bank. And finally, we'll have a quick look at how we report cash on the balance sheet. Uh, fraud, in uh, a general definition of it here, is a dishonest act by an employee that results in personal benefit to the employee at a cost to the employer. Um, and we always want to know why does fraud occur. Uh, obviously, some people are more susceptible to uh, criminal activities than others. Um, but if if people don't have the opportunity, then obviously they can't commit fraud. Uh, but there's also factors of financial pressure, uh, and then the ability or inability to rationalize uh, things. Uh, I would like to tell the story when I was uh, 16 and a desk clerk at the Halloween in Fort Dodge that uh, we sold items uh, that didn't get rung up in the cash register until the close of the day. We sold things like Elka seltzer and cigars and uh, just um, Tums and uh, aspirin and those kinds of things. And instead of recording them, putting, ringing them up in the cash register as we went along, we just threw the money in a box underneath the counter. Uh, I guess the theory was that we'd make uh, we'd make one entry at the end of the day on the cash register and make fewer mistakes. But because we didn't record that and the money sat in the cash box, um, I would watch the innkeeper, the manager of a Holiday Inn, come up and take 50 cents out and go out and buy cigarettes. And as I watched him do that, I you know I started thinking to myself, well maybe that's okay. Maybe I should take a quarter out and go buy a can of uh, Coke or something. Uh, obviously, as I had opportunity. Uh, the rationalization was that if the manager did it, it might be okay for everybody else to do it. I didn't feel a lot of financial pressure to do it. Okay, how do employees steal? Uh, the top item, or at least in terms of percentages, uh, billing. They uh, come up with uh, bonus billing schemes. Um, Expense reimbursement, they falsify things on their expense request. There's check tampering, uh, payroll fraud, and wire transfer fraud. Uh, payroll fraud is you know, probably people padding hours on their time card or maybe creating uh, fictitious employees. Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Um, requires that companies develop principles of control over financial reporting and continually verify that controls are working. Uh, once a year, the independent auditors come in and they must uh, attest to the adequacy of internal controls. Methods and measures. Uh, internal controls are methods and measures adopted to safeguard assets, um, make sure that their assets stay in place, Enhance the accuracy and reliability of accounting records, increase efficiency of operations, and ensure compliance with laws and regulations. Uh, good internal control systems have these five primary components. Uh, the first one, and absolute key, is it's a control environment. It's a it's a message from the top that says fraud is not acceptable or we have to follow good internal controls. Uh, companies know if their top managers don't don't buy off on that. If top managers are uh, spending money frivolously and padding their expense accounts, pretty much everybody uh, knows about it. Uh, second is risk assessment by management. Management has to look at the activities and identify areas where they have exposure. Uh, and then take the steps to limit that exposure. 
uh, for control activities via policies and procedures. You have to have written policies and procedures. You have to insist that they're followed all the time. Uh, information and communication about the system and between different departments. And finally, uh, monitoring of the system. We have to make sure that uh, we, we set this great system up. Now we need to make sure that people are following. So principles of internal control activities. Um, first bullet here about management's assessment of risk face. Um, if there's very little risk, I mean, if this is a a, a remote site uh, and all we have on hand is some petty cash, we maybe don't need real elaborate, expensive internal controls. On the other hand, if this is the uh, uh, office at a very busy retail store where we have a lot of cash uh, and currency and checks coming in we may we may need extra uh, safeguards there and the size and the nature of the company will will dictate things so we'll have six general principles of controls and we'll look at those in some detail but establish responsibility segregate duties uh, document uh, procedures physical controls independent internal verification and human resource controls. We have to have all six of those in place to uh, have a chance at good controls. So first one, establishment of responsibility, says control is most effective when only one person is responsible for a given task. Uh, obviously if you've got eight people responsible for something they can blame each other when things go wrong. But if only one person is responsible, then it's hard for them to blame other people. Segregation of duties. Um, have related duties. I'm sorry, segregation of duties. Uh, related duties, including physical custody and record keeping, should be assigned to different people. Uh, we don't want one person to be responsible for keeping the asset, uh, keeping track of the documentation, and doing the accounting for it. We need to separate those uh, responsibilities and those duties. Uh, documentation procedures. Companies need to use pre-numbered documents for as many documents as they can. Uh, that way you can account for things. Clearly, uh, checks need to be numbered. Sales invoices need to be numbered. We we try and number everything we can so that we have internal control over it. Physical controls are also important. Um, these are uh, hardware, physical things you can touch. Uh, safes, vaults, safe deposit boxes for cash and business papers. Uh, it's, if you keep money in a safe, it's a lot harder for somebody to steal it than if it's in a cash register, and certainly much harder in either of those two than if it's just lying on the counter. Um, locked warehouses and storage cabinets for inventories and records. Uh, computer facilities where we need uh, passwords or some of the more fancy systems now do fingerprint or eyeball scans. Um, other physical controls might be TV uh, uh, monitors, but the time elapsed monitors so we can see what's going on in a department. Um, we mentioned uh, in one of the previous uh, videos that uh, Walmart had some sensors to, to different products. Uh, they have them in garments, uh, more expensive items, but they also have them in electronic items. Time clocks for recording time work, uh, excellent internal control. No point letting people uh, pencil in their time sheet when we can have an inexpensive time clock there. And then alarms uh, that prevent break-ins. That uh, If there is a break-in, at least the alarm goes off and we have a chance of, of catching them. Independent internal verification. So we verify the records. Periodically or on a surprise basis, uh, records are verified by an employee who is independent, who is not part of the process, and discrepancies are reported to management. Um, 
when I used to do internal auditing, we would uh, go out and audit petty cash funds. We'd show up at a at a remote site, unannounced. Uh, it's a surprise visit, and we'd sit down with the person who was responsible for petty cash fund, and we would count it, and we'd look at the receipts that they had. Uh, if there was any discrepancies, uh, we reported it uh, to management. Human resource controls, um, bonding of employees is is a potential. Um, there's a there's a cost involved in bonding employees, but uh, it it probably is in my mind it's more of an insurance than a internal control. Although presumably if somebody had a a past record, uh, they wouldn't be able to get bonded, and, and that would flag uh, our interest in them. Uh, Want to rotate employees' duties and require vacations. Um, I like to talk about the big bank fraud uh, in the 1960s in Sheldon, Iowa. A little bitty Sheldon, Iowa. Um, a woman in her 60s had worked at the bank forever, and everybody in town loved her, uh, embezzled a huge amount of money from the bank. She finally got caught when she took a vacation. Somebody insisted that after... You know, 10 or 15 years or something like that of working at the bank and not taking one that she'd take a vacation and as soon as she did uh, all kinds of problems started cropping up and then conduct uh, background checks of employees only an accountant would uh, draw this cartoon just goofy so under the uh, Sarbanes-Oxley Act a company needs to keep track of employees degrees and certifications to ensure that uh, employees continue to meet the spe specified requirements of job. And if you read through here, you'll find that one corporation who did this, this corporation had 17,000 employees, and it found there were 400 people who did not report to anyone. And they had 35 people who reported to each other. Uh, now you talk about a situation ripe for uh, internal control problems. If you've got employees who don't report to anybody, and you have 35 people reporting to each other, uh, you have opportunities for collusion and just plain outright uh, theft. Some limitations here. Uh, the cost of the internal control shouldn't exceed the benefit. And God bless in, internal auditors and external auditors, but they can get a little nuts about this stuff and have companies spend all kinds of money on some controls that they're probably not that much at risk. Uh, there's a human element to internal controls. Um, you, you can have internal perfect internal controls in place, but if two or three employees get together, uh, they can uh, form different kinds of collusion activities, and they can bypass these internal controls and rip off a company. So, uh, the size of the business, um, you know, if you look at the small mom and pop store, they're not going to have all these fancy internal controls. Somebody like a Walmart and a Walgreens and a Sears and an Abbott Labs and a Tyson and those large companies. Uh, have zillions of transactions and they've got the resources to have all kinds of controls. And the last bullet here is that no system is perfect. Um, internal auditors don't guarantee that they'll catch all fraud. Uh, it's just you, you can't catch all fraud unless you're going to look at every single transaction and that's not possible. Zeroing in a little bit on the cash control, and we worry about cash because it is so darn easy to steal. It's a little harder to steal inventory, harder to dispose of inventory, at least some inventory. But cash is pretty universal, easy to steal, easy to spend. Uh, so establishment responsibility, only designated personnel are authorized to handle cash receipts, i.e. if we have something like ca cashiers in our company. Um, going across the top then we have documentation procedures, uh, we use remittance advices, 
and what we get in the mail, catch register tape, deposit slips. We keep track of all that, that paperwork that will help us uh, document what's, what's happening. We have independent internal verification. Uh, supervisors count the daily cash receipts. Uh, somebody, a treasurer, or somebody in the company compares total receipts to bank deposits every day. Then we have segregation of duties. We have different people responsible for receiving the cash, uh, making the deposit, holding the cash, and then make doing the accounting entries for it. And if you you know if you're a very small business, uh, likely you, you violate that segregation of duties. You may have one person who opens the mail, makes out the bank deposit, and records the cash. And, and the, Counting records, um, bad idea. But if you're small enough that you know you haven't got other people, throw out the problem. Um, physical, mechanical, and electronic controls. Um, we we keep the cash in safes and bank vaults. We limit access to storage areas. We use cash registers. We don't use cigar boxes. Um, Human resource controls, we bond personnel who handle cash, require employees to take vacations, deposit all cash in the bank daily. So cash, it, coins, currency, checks, money orders, money on hand, deposits in the bank, uh, comes from cash sales, collections on account from customers, uh, interest, uh, rent, dividends that we might receive. The owners might make investments. It could be proceeds from a bank loan or proceeds from a sale of a non-current asset. It can be refund checks from different places. So over the counter receipt, here we have a clerk who is ringing up the sales and counts the cash. Uh, at the end of the shift, they uh, have some kind of procedure where they close out their cash register. They send the cash on to the cashier, uh, and she counts the money, or he counts the money, prepares, makes a deposit ticket, and then we send the cash and deposit ticket to the bank. While well, a copy of the deposit slip gets sent, sent over to the accounting department. Um, working parallel, the supervisor uh, removes the lock cash register tape from cash register and sends it to the accounting department. The accounting department can then uh, compare the deposit that was made with what shows on the cash register tape, and the accounting department makes the, any journal entries they need. When we receive items via the mail, uh, control procedures are a little different, but they suggest here that mail receipt should be opened by two people, uh, a list of what's received is prepared and each check is endorsed. And by endorsing a check, in theory, only the companies can only be deposited in the company's bank account. Um, you know, mail receipts are built by two people. I guess you're opening the mail and you pull the checks out and give it to somebody else who, who logs them. And you're kind of watching each other to make sure that happens. A uh, copy of the list of the checks, along with the uh, checks and remittance advices, sent to cashier's department. Um, I would suggest that we not send everything to the cashier's department, because then we just turned everything over to the cashier's department. So we may want to keep a list. The list might get sent to the treasurer or somebody else, uh, but the checks and remittance advices would get sent to the cashier's department. Uh, cashier adds the checks to the over-the-counter receipts and prepares daily cash summary, makes the daily bank deposit. A uh, copy of the list uh, sent to the treasurer's office for comparison of total shown on daily cash summary. And maybe the treasurer's office is also a place getting the uh, cash register receipts. Cash disbursements controls. Um, you know. You have fewer opportunities for theft if you're paying bills by check rather than paying them in cash. You start paying things in cash, and again, it's just easier to uh, rip it off. There's voucher systems, um, but we'll kick around in petty cash fund. But 
good internal controls on cash disbursements, uh, establishment of responsibility. Only designated personnel are authorized to sign the checks and to approve vendors. We have documentation procedures. We use pre-numbered checks. Uh, checks have a, have an invoice that have to go with it. Uh, if we're using credit cards, uh, we have to have authorized employees using them. Uh, we have independent internal verification. We compare checks to invoices. We reconcile the monthly bank statement looking for abnormalities. We segregate duties again. Uh, different individuals approve payment than the ones make payment. Check signers uh, don't uh, make journal entries. We have physical controls, so we store the blank checks and safes with limited access. If we're using a uh, using a machine to print checks, we keep that under lock and key, and we use an ink that uh, people can't alter. And then human resource controls again: we bond personnel, handle cash, uh, require employees take vacations, conduct background checks. Voucher system is uh, a, a system where when we when we receive a bill, when we receive an invoice from a company, we prepare a voucher for it. A cover, a, think of it as a covering piece of paper, and there will be different people who have to sign off on this voucher. Maybe somebody in the receiving department will have to sign off that we actually received the goods. Uh, we might have to have a copy of a purchase order where we initiated it to get the goods from the company. Somebody from the treasurer's office might have to sign off on it. So ideally we have three or four signatures of people looking, uh, making sure this is a valid payment. Petty cash funds. Uh, businesses use petty cash funds to pay small amounts. Um, Think of uh, oh maybe you, maybe you buy an occasional newspaper or somebody comes in and they're selling a raffle tickets and you give them a buck here or a buck there and it's just it's just small items um, maybe you want to send an employee out to buy some paper towels for the lunchroom you don't want to go write checks out for that sort of thing so we have petty cash funds available for it. So we, we'll look at some journal entries here. First we look at this chapter uh, to establish the fund, making payments from the fund, and replenishing the fund. So example here, if the Laird Company decides to set up a $100 fund on March 1st, the journal entry is debit to credit cash, and credit to cash for $100. We actually write a check out to uh, Petty Cash we go down to the bank, cash the check, bring the hundred dollars in petty cash back, and put it in some kind of a lockbox or in a file cabinet or someplace that isn't real visible. Uh, we assume that on March 15th, whoever is the custodian for the petty cash requests a check for eighty-seven dollars. The fund still has thirteen dollars in cash, and out of out of the initial hundred dollars, we've spent eighty-seven. We spent $44 for freight, I'm sorry, for postage. We spent $38 on freight out. We had miscellaneous expenses of $5. So to replenish the fund, we make an entry that looks like this. Debit the expense accounts to freight out to miscellaneous expense and credit cash for 87 you know, we go down to bank, write a check for $87, and bring the $87 back and put it in the petty cash fund. Now, how much is in the petty cash fund? $100 again. Occasionally, the company may need to recognize a cash shortage or overage. Assume that Laird's petty cash custodian has only $12 in the fund, plus the receipts is listed below. Um, receipts were only for $80. Seven dollars. So clearly, we uh, we misplaced a dollar somewhere. So if that's the case, we'd make a journal entry that looked like this, with a debit to cash over and short. So we look at using a uh, bank account. Um, I don't I don't know businesses that don't use bank accounts. There probably are some. 
but uh, minimize the amount of currency on hand, create a double record of bank transactions, and then we do a bank reconciliation. So some pictures here of making bank deposits. Writing checks. So we make bank deposits daily. Uh, we write checks as needed. We have authorized signers on the checks. Uh, then we get bank statements. And, uh, you know, hopefully most of you have got, got checking accounts and reconcile your bank accounts as well. Um, we get debit memorandums, for example, bank service charge. Or, uh, typically, banks charge businesses uh, something for, for checking accounts. And there may be NSF, which is non-sufficient fund checks. So if, if we made a deposit, yeah, but the customer didn't have enough money in their account, then it comes back to us. Now we have credit memorandums. Uh, more commonly, it might be interest that we earned, or in some cases, banks help us collect notes. But different things that might get deposited to our account that we aren't aware of until we get a bank statement. So reconciling the bank account, uh, we come up with a balance per of a bank and a balance per of a books. And then we adjust both of those to a, quote, corrected cash balance. Uh, reconciling items, deposits that are in transit. Those are deposits that we've recorded on our books the bank hasn't gotten yet. You know, it might be something that happens over a weekend when the bank is closed and it takes a day for the bank to process it. Outstanding checks, checks that we've written but they haven't cleared the bank yet. Uh, errors that we've made over bank has made. And then bank memorandum like the uh, uh, debit or credit memos for uh, collection items or paid items. So here's the, uh, the way this is supposed to work. On the left hand column we've got the bank statement. Uh, then we do adjustments to the bank balance. We add deposits in transit. We subtract outstanding checks and we add or subtract bank errors and we come up with a correct or adjusted balance. Then we look at what we have on our books in our cash account. And we add items that have been collected by the bank, add uh, or subtract uh, non-sufficient fund checks, uh, subtract service charges or printing charges, and then we adjust for any company error. So we come up with a corrected balance. And those two balances should equal each other. You know, reconciling a bank account is much easier if you, if you keep this concept in mind that we're we're going from a bank balance to a corrected balance, a book balance to a corrected balance. We're not trying to marry the two ideas here. So an example, a uh, bank statement for Laird Company shows a balance uh, per the bank of $15,907.45 on April 30th. On this date, the balance of cash per the books is $11,589.45. So Clearly, the bank and the books don't agree, so we need to adjust both of them to get to an actual uh, balance. We use a four-step reconciliation. Uh, Laird determines the following reconciling items. Uh, first one is deposits in transit. There's an April 30th deposit that we recorded on our books, but the bank didn't get it until May 1st, so clearly it isn't recorded by the bank yet. So that's $2,201.40. We have outstanding checks, uh, one, two, three, four checks, I guess, for a total of $5,904. Checks that we've written, so we subtract them from our cash account, but they haven't cleared the bank yet. And then we have an error. Uh, we wrote a check for $1,226, and the bank correctly paid that amount. However, when we recorded it, uh, we recorded it $1,262. So we have a $36 uh, error. That's something we'll need to adjust on our books because it's our error. It's not a bank error. And the bank uh, has some memorandum for us. Uh, they returned a check from J.R. Barron for $425.60. Uh, 
we asked the bank to print some more checks for us, give us some check blanks. The bank charged us thirty dollars for that. And then there was a uh, the bank helped us collect a note. Uh, they put a thousand dollars in our account plus fifty dollars interest that we earned on it. And the bank charged the collection fee at fifteen dollars. So we have a net there of a thousand thirty five. So the, uh, these three items are all items that uh, the bank has recorded, but we haven't recorded them yet. So we need to get these last three items on our site. So we log in the cash balance for the bank statement, cash balance for the books. The deposit and transit goes to the uh, bank statement. It's an addition, plus the outstanding checks. We have a cash, uh, an had the error of $36 on check 443. Uh, subtract a non sufficient fund check. Subtract a bank service charge for printing the checks. Then we throw in the $1,035 we got from the note receivable. And then we come up with those adjusted cash balances of $12,204.85. And lucky for us, they agree. They have to agree. Then we look at uh, what we need to record on our books, to adjusting entries that we need to make. Uh, so assume here the interest of $50 has not been accrued and the collection fee is charged to miscellaneous expense. So to record the note receivable, debit cash $1,035, credit miscellaneous expense for $15, credit notes receivable for $1,000, interest revenue for $50. And the bank error, I'm sorry, the, the book error, where we recorded that payment incorrectly, we need to debit cash 36 and credit accounts payable 36 to get that uh, error off the books. Um, indicated earlier, an NSF check becomes an accounts receivable to us, so we're going to debit accounts receivable and credit cash for 2560. And then the uh, bank service charge. Debit miscellaneous expense, credit cash, $30 for the uh, bank charges. Electronic fund transfers are uh, obviously getting popular everywhere. Probably some of you do your banking online. Uh, but disbursement systems that use wire, telephone, or computers to transfer cash balances between locations. And uh, it says EFT transfers normally result in better internal control since no cash or checks are handled by company employees. So when we report cash on the balance sheet, um, we're look, talking about the coins we have on hand, the currency, paper money, checks, money orders, other money on hand, deposits in a bank or similar, or similar institution. So this is Eastman Kodak balance sheet. So in uh, 2006 they had one million or sorry one billion four hundred and sixty nine million dollars of uh, cash on hand uh, we talk about cash equivalents things that can get converted to cash real easily might be something like an overnight treasury bond or bill that we can sell in a hurry cash that's restricted um, might be a we, we might have borrowed some money and the bank will give us a good loan as long as we leave X amount of money in the bank. And then there's compensating balances that work kind of much the same way. So conclusion, um, internal controls are, are vital to businesses. Um, cash gets a whole lot of focus because it's easy to, uh, cash is easy to steal and spend. Uh, inventory is a little harder. But we, we need good internal controls over all of those areas. Uh, bank reconciliations are vital. Um, it, it's a small business. You probably don't want the bookkeeper to do the bank reconciliation. That might be the kind of thing the owner has to take the time to do because that's a good internal control over the uh, uh, bookkeeper. I was the uh, treasurer of a, a nonprofit group for a year or two, 20 years ago, I suppose, or 15. And, uh, I did catch the executive director of this nonprofit writing out a check to himself 
and uh, if I hadn't if I hadn't been doing the bank reconciliation, I wouldn't have caught that. The guy would have cleaned us out, and he wouldn't have felt bad about it.